What's good, Cubers? It's your boy, Matt. I'm back. Today, we're going to talk about how to keep your cube in healthy form and talk about aggro. A few weeks ago, I made a video for new Cubers giving them tips on building their cube. And one of the things I said was that you need to support aggro to keep your cube healthy, which led to me getting some questions on how to support aggro or that I'm having trouble building aggro or my aggro decks never seem to win. So today, we're going to talk all about aggro and how to make those strategies work inside of our cubes let's get started we're gonna start with red first because that is the typical aggressive color even if you don't have aggro anywhere else you should support it in red and the key to aggro is having seven to eight one drops if your cube is 360 to 400 cards one drops are what make aggro work in every color because they need something to play on turn one they need to reliably play a one drop on turn one and maybe another one on turn three so let's look at red's key one drop Drops. Goblin Guide, Monastery Swift Spear, and Fire Drinker Seder are all solid one drops for red. In fact, Goblin Guide is the premier one drop and probably the most expensive card in the red aggro suite. Haste is really important for red. Anything that lets them get in and attack early. Swift Spear doesn't have two power and most aggro creatures do. But Powress is such a good ability on this card because Red's going to be playing Burn Spells, which lets Monastery Swift Spear swing in for 2 or sometimes 3 damage. Fire Drinker Seder is good but not great. You're going to notice he's part of a common theme in our 1-drops, and that is we need 2 power, and as a result we'll play some creatures that aren't perfect in order to get it. Let's look at the next set of red one drops you could play. Stormkirk Noble is nice, he can't be blocked by humans, you'll be surprised how relevant that is in cube. And whenever he hits a player, he gets a plus one, plus one counter. So he doesn't have haste, but if you're lucky enough to play him on turn one, odds are he'll be a 2-2 or maybe even a 3-3 and then things really start to get out of control. Bell Striker can't block creatures with power 2 or greater, but you don't care because you're in the aggro deck, and I have found that dash is relevant. Sometimes you really want to just play him in swing because the board is open and you want to land that damage to put your opponent in lightning bolt range. Falcon Wrath Gorger is... Well... He's got two power, and that 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 that's what we're looking for. <laughs> Most of the rest of the text on him is just flavor text. He's basically a red savanna lions. Although occasionally you do play some vampires in cube like Drano or Vampire Nighthawk. <laughs> Still, mostly, like I said, it's just flavor text. We're playing him for a 2-1 on turn one. That's the important part. But now when we get to the red two drops, that's when things really get interesting. Karizev, Earthshaker, Kenra, and Young Pyromancer. For my mana, these guys are some of the premier two drops for the red aggro deck. Kari is impossible to block. She doesn't have haste, but when she swings in on turn three and makes the monkey, she's impossible to block. She's got the menace. She's got first strike, which means your opponent needs to block the monkey token or take the damage, both of which you're fine with. Earthshaker Kenra has haste. That's what we're looking for. And he turns off your opponent's blockers a lot of the times so the turn he comes down, which means you get to get in with him and your one drop again if they've played something in between those turns. And Young Pyromancer is great in every red deck. It seems like you're always slinging spells. In this case, you're going to be throwing lightning bolts and fire bolts around. And as a result, you're going to make 1 1 elementals and it's going to be all gravy. Tier 2, red 2 drops. Stormblood Berserker doesn't have haste, but you're going to hit them with that one drop, so he's going to come in as a 3-3 for two, which is fantastic. And he has Menace, essentially, because he can't be blocked except by two or more creatures. Uh, Abbot of Carol Keep is another power rest dude, and late game he'll let you draw a card, which might help you find that burn spell you need. If you play him on turn two, you're not going to be able to cast whatever you exile off the top of your library. But late game, there's some bonus there. And Goblin Crater Maker isn't great for the aggro deck, but being able to get rid of that colorless non-land permanent can be really important. It'll shut down an ensnaring bridge, or that two damage will help clear a blocker so that the red deck can get in one more time. Moving to the three drop slot in red aggro, life is just all about Goblin Rabble Master. He's what you want. He's so good. If he can attack unmolested, he just, ooh, the clock he puts your opponent on. There's a whole bunch of Rabble Master variants now. We've got Hanwar Garrison, Najila, Goblin Warboss is the worst of these in my opinion. But I will really like Krinko the 10 Street Kingpin. He's not as aggressive as Najila and Hanwar Garrison, but 
when you swing in, he pumps, and the pump is permanent, so he's a 2-3. And if he's able to swing in one more time, he's a 3-4, and now your opponent is in real trouble. And Rampaging Ferocidon has that incidental, your opponent can't gain life. It's a 3-3 with Menace, so it's hard to block. And normally he's a little extra damage on the field because your opponent's going to be playing bodies to try and slow down your deck, and they're going to be taking damage for it. Now we're getting to the top of our red aggro curve. When we move into the 4-drop and 5-drop slot, you're going to want just a couple of creatures up here. And if I can only have one, I want Hellrider. This card is dumb. This is that card that you play and your opponent feels like, oh, I've stabilized, I've got some bodies, I'm not going to have to take damage this turn. And then you play Hellrider and turn your whole board sideways. And when you do, every single creature gets to deal a damage to your opponent. And suddenly they're taking five before you ever even land an attack. So good. Hellrider is fantastic. Hazaret is great for when you've run out of gas because that's what wakes him up. And then you can discard cards to deal damage. Wonderful. And Glorybringer. I know you're in the aggro deck and you're thinking, I don't want a 5-drop. Picking a card like Glorybringer or Thundermaw Hellkite can really give the red deck just the last bit of push it needs to get in and deal that lethal damage. Glorybringer will deal 4, maybe clear something on the ground, and you and your team will connect for the win. But this isn't all you need to do to support red aggro. There are a few other incidental cards you should think about including in your queue. In particularly, I love Sulfuric Vortex. Two damage to each player, no life gain. You don't care about your life, you're in red, you've got more life than your opponent at this point in the game, and putting them on that consistent clock, hey, you're gonna take two. And if you don't do something quick, it doesn't even matter if you clear my board because I'm gonna beat you to death with the Vortex. Shrining of Burning Rage is another incidental red damage card that over the course of the game accrues value and then you get to the point where you just always leave three mana up so that you can sack it, pull the charge counters off, and deal that final bit of damage to your opponent. And now there are a hundred lightning bolt variants, lightning bolt, incinerate, chain lightning, fire bolt. You're going to be playing burn in your cube incidentally anyway and the aggro deck wants the burn. You need to draft the burn. This is how you clear the way for your little creatures and how you finish your opponent off at the end of the game. But Wizards has been really great to red aggro players lately and we've got some new spicy cards from the last guilds and allegiance blocks of Ravnica. Fantastic. Risk Factor, play this card in your queue. I promise you it's going to surprise you. The first time you cast it, your opponent goes, yeah, ow, I'll take four. But the second time you cast it, when you jump start it out of your yard, and your opponent's at 7, 8 life, and they're thinking about dropping down into lightning bolt range, there's just no good decision for them. And that's the important part. This card does give your opponent the right to choose, but you're fine with both options. You take four, fantastic. I get to draw three, fantastic. Either way, you're happy. Experimental Frenzy, this card. Oh my gosh, I have just murdered people with this card in standard. It's so good. So here's the deal. You're going to play two or three spells off the top of your library every turn. Every turn. It's going to be great. And then when you, the only thing that slows you down at all is double land. And sometimes there's even ways to get around that depending on which walkers you're running in your cube. Experimental Frenzy is just dumb. And if your opponent manages to deal with it, by the time they do, you've got a few extra cards in your hand and now you're able to cast those as well. So Experimental Frenzy plays things that your opponent has to deal with and they have to deal with the Frenzy and if they manage to deal with all of that by then you've drawn two or three more cards and oh, Experimental Frenzy is so good. And lastly is Light Up the Stage. I love this card. You're always going to cast it for one in the aggro deck. Just always. Always cast it for one and draw two more cards and just keep on going. Now. Pro tip, don't play your land for the turn until you cast Light Up the Stage. That way you can cast that land out of exile if you happen to flip one off the top of your deck. Pro tip, your boy bats got you. Now I want to take this moment to re-emphasize 7 to 8 one drops in your cube to make this work. It's really important. Let's take a look at white and you'll see another example of why. In white, we're really running a bunch of different Savannah Lion variants, the best versions that we can get. So, white creatures for one mana that have two power and one toughness. That's just what we do. So, we want to run those creatures and then have the best upsides we can get. 
So Kytheon is probably one of the best one drops we can run because he flips over into Big Gideon and then you beat your opponent's face in. Dauntless Bodyguard is really solid, especially if he comes in later in the game because he can protect another two drop or three drop if you happen to play him late. And Sky Marcher Aspirant is really good. Now I know that you're looking at it and you're like, Matt, I'm not going to ascend. I'm in the aggro deck. And you are. You are in the aggro deck. But you never know. And you're, like I said, we're going to play some cards that are slightly suboptimal because we want two power, one toughness. When we look at the tier two cards, we've got Mother of Runes. And I know what you're thinking, but she's not aggressive, Matt. Like she doesn't swing in for two on turn one. Yeah, but she makes sure that every creature you got gets to connect from then on, and she protects all your creatures too, and she protects herself. Mother of Runes, you, you need a copy of this card in your cube. Student of Warfare gets to swing in on turn two as a 3-3 first striker, and that presents a lot of problems for your opponent. And then Mardu Woe Reaper is another example of a, we're playing a 2-1 and we need 2-1, so we'll play some suboptimal creatures. You could also play Dragon Hunter, Soldier of the Pantheon, Isamaru the Hound of Kanda, or even Savannah Lions, just straight up old school Savannah Lions. You need seven to eight one drops. Seven to eight one drops, boys and girls, if you don't take anything else away from this, take that. Now, when we move to the white two drop slot, you'll notice that there's no haste going on inside the white section. So we need creatures that can effectively swing in as two drops on turn three and survive combat. That's why we play these guys. Thalia has first strike, which makes attacking a lot safer. And because non-creature spells cost one more, sometimes she's gonna just straight time walk your opponent because they're not able to cast their removal spell on turn. The only way you're really gonna know is to ask them after the game, or maybe you see their spells come down a turn later because they're having to pay for Thalia. But trust me, that text is not flavor text. Next up is Adanto Vanguard. I love this card. He gets to attack as a 3-1, and you can pay for a life to give him indestructible. Again, we're in the aggro deck. We don't care about our life. I'll gladly play for Vanguard the first and probably the second time I need to save his life. Glorybound Initiate gets to exert when he attacks in, so if the board is clear, you swing in, you deal three. If the board is not clear, you exert him, and now he's a 4-4, and your opponent blocks, and you eat whatever they were blocking him with, or they take four. And again, they get choice, but you're fine with either. As we look at the next tier of two drops, there's some other spicy cards. Again, we want to be able to swing in on turn three. So Selfless Spirit is a fine two drop because he flies and has evasion. There aren't a lot of two mana flyers in Q. So most of the time, this early flyer is going to get to connect, and he protects your boards from Wraths, which is really good on turns three and four. Imposing Sovereign makes all your opponent's creatures enter the battlefield tap, which is effectively a time walk. If you play Sovereign on an empty board on turn two, when you pass the turn, whatever your opponent plays comes down tapped, and Sovereign gets to swing in. So again, she gets to attack on turn three. The last mention is a quarter pal paladin. I have cut this guy from my cube, but if you have a copy laying around, you're welcome to play him. He's not a bad creature. The thing is, is that when he swings in on turn three, he's probably gonna die. If your opponent is able to play anything in front of this guy, they're gonna kill him. They're going to kill him. Now he is gonna buff all your other creatures and that's fantastic and busted and awesome but he's gonna die immediately and so you're not gonna get that reusable value it's not just safe to just blindly swing in with the paladin on turn three the way it is with a lot of the other white two drops white threes are kind of interesting there's another thalia we can play and again she makes your creatures and non-basic lands of your opponents enter the battlefield tapped time walking them so that you can swing in on turn four and she's a three two with first strike which is really strong on turn three in cube Brimaz is a 3-4 four for 3, which is great on rate. It has Vigilance, so it can attack and block, and he makes Cat Soldier creature tokens with Vigilance every time you do that, which again is just fantastic. Uh, you know, he's, he's doing it all. He's blocking, he's attacking, he's defending, he's making your board wider. It's just everything you want. And then lastly, I'll mention Banalish Marshall. If your cube is really small, if you're at 360, you might not be able to squeeze him in, and that triple white cost is prohibitive. He is perfectly designed for the white weenie deck. He's everything they want. He's a three mana three three that buffs the whole board. So if you played Thalia on turn two, when you play the Marshall on turn three, now Thalia is a three one striker, first striker, and that that feels really, 
really good. But Alish Marshall, he's the real deal. If you can squeeze him in, I recommend him. When we move to the four drop slot in white, it's all about going wide. Leonin War Leader makes cats when he attacks, which is, you know, more cats. Absolutely. Him, Brimaz, Cat Tribal. Okay, not, not really Cat Tribal, but still. The War Leader, he's really impressed me since M19. I've really enjoyed having him in my cube. And he does what he's really doing is a Hero of Blade Hold imitation. Hero of Blade Hold has the battle cry that the Quarter Paladin has. The only difference is she has four toughness. So you're going to get to swing with her and maybe she won't die when she makes her tokens. And so you might get to swing with her a couple of times and get the buff on your board a couple of times. Hero of Blade Hold is the best four drop for the White Weenie deck. And just like the Red Aggro deck, you might run a five drop. And if you do, I want Angel of Invention. Flying, Vigilance, Lifelink, and buff your whole board, and she makes your board even wider. That's what you want. You want creature buffs and wide boards for the White Weenie deck because they can't do things the way the Red Aggro deck did. The White Weenie needs support too, and they're not playing Lightning Bolt, so they need ways to clear their board and cards that synergize and help them go wide. And So we want to... No, no, we, d we don't. We don't want Swords to Plowshares. Go away, Swords to Plowshares. See, here's the thing. If you draft Swords to Plowshares and then you exile something of your opponents, you're going to give them life, and that means you are effectively negating a turn of attacks that you made. So you don't want to play Swords to Plowshares. Instead, you want to play different Oblivion Ring variants, or maybe even Path to Exile, although I don't like the idea of ramping my opponent either. Cards like Oblivion Ring deal with any permanent problem. So if your opponent's got a pesky planeswalker who's making tokens, you exile it. Your opponent's got an artifact that's shutting you down, you exile it. Your opponent's got a creature that's giving you problems, you exile it. I like the Oblivion Rings for the White Weenie deck more than I like cards like Swords to Plowshares. History of Benalia has really playtested great for us. Making the 2-2 two, two Knights doesn't feel good the first turn, but on turn 2 when you make another one for free, or on the third turn when she buffs them all and you swing in, and then maybe you've got some incidental Knights in your cube. Oh my gosh, Hero, History of Benalia feels really, really good. And when you get to go wide and swing in on that third chapter, oh, you just see your opponent's heart sink. Now the drawback is you are telegraphing what you're about to do. Your opponent has time to prepare for it. But a lot of the times in the White Weenie deck, they're so busy dealing with everything else that you do that history is on the back burner. Gideon Blackblade. I wasn't hyped about this card when it came out. I I, I was, what, what, what do you call it? I, I was wrong. I was wrong. Gideon Blackblade is dumb. This card does work in the White Weenie deck. First of all, it's always a human soldier. It's always awake on your turn. Every other Gideon Walker requires you to plus them or minus them or zero them in order to turn them on, which means that's the only use you get out of Gideon that turn. But this Gideon, he's always awake. And then you can plus him to give something else Vigilance, Life Link, or Indestructible, which in the White Weenie deck means it's safe to turn it sideways. And if he gets to stick around a couple of turns, maybe he exiles your opponent's five drop that they play to try and slow you down. Gideon Blackblade is just, it's, it's really good. It's really good. That's going to do it for today, Cubers. I really hope that you are actively supporting aggro in your cube. I promise it will make your play experiences better. Don't let dirtily mid-range and control decks just run your cube. Don't reward your drafters for playing super slow decks. Include the aggro deck. Cubes need the fun police. And again, one more time, for the people in the back. You need seven to eight one drops in your aggro colors. Seven to eight red drops, seven to eight white one drops. You gotta have them. Gotta have them, all right? Number one mistake new cubers make. Be sure to let me know what your favorite aggressive white and red cards are. If there's archetypes or things you want us to cover or a card for card of the week, leave it all in the comments below. Follow us on Twitter at Cube for Two. And as always, and until next time, shuffle up and keep cubing, my friends.